Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, distinguished uh, public lecture that is uh, co-sponsored by both the Centre for Liberal Arts and Social Sciences and, uh, the, and also by NIST, the Nanyang uh, Technological Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity. Um, my name is Hallam Stevens. I'm the Associate Director of that um, institute. And I'm very pleased today to welcome uh, Helga uh, Novotny. Um, she, I, I've had the pleasure of um, uh, introducing Helga before, actually, and the wonderful thing about introducing somebody uh, who has, is such, has such a distinguished uh, reputation is that I can always say different things about her every time <laughs> I, I introduce her. Um, so Helga has had many, um, she's currently an emeritus um, professor uh, at uh, ETH um, in the Social Studies of Science. Uh, she's held uh, very many um, positions on academic boards, uh, in public policy positions, um, that has allowed her to influence not only um, a kind of wide influence within the academic world and within my field of science and technology studies, but also well beyond that as well. Uh, very wide influence on uh, public policy um, in a variety of contexts, particularly in Europe, and you know, one of her um, one of her sort of most distinguished positions was as the president of the European Research. She was a founding member and then president of the European Research Council between 2010 and 2013. Um, perhaps I'll just draw attention to um, one of uh, Helga's more recent publications, her book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, which I believe was published in 2015, um, in, in which um, Helga uh, examines the ways in which the scientific process uh, and the creative process um, actually works. And that is related, I think, to her topic um, today, where she's going to talk about experimenting, experiencing, and reflecting, and the relationship between art and science. <coughs> Thank you, Hel Thank you, Haldem, and welcome, everyone. Can you hear me? Because I am supposed to be connected through a mic with you. Is it okay? Perfect. Wonderful. I want to start with a <coughs> biographical confession, how I got to, uh, to the topic of art and science. As you heard from Hallam, I was professor at ETH Zurich, a very um, <coughs> well-known international research um, university in Switzerland. And <coughs> ETH Zurich decided to set up something perhaps like your Center for Liberal Arts, um, uh, etc., which was called the Collegium Helveticum. And the Collegium Helveticum was housed in a beautiful building, an architectural gem, which was done by the famous architect Semper for the first professor of astronomy at ETH Zurich. So we had a tower with an observatory on top that of course um, going back to 1864 was no longer in use but it had been restored beautifully and in those days in Europe, the professor of astronomy did not only teach there, but he actually lived in this building. And he was a bachelor, so he had his sister to move in with him, and we were using the space of this former apartment. Every room was decorated in a different color, and you can imagine it was a great place. Now, what were we doing there? we were asked by ETH to do something for science, <clears throat> namely outreach. And so we organized um, <clears throat> very interesting symposia for the scientists working at ETH, but also open to the general public. And at the same time, um, we had the task to do something for young people. And so I was able to invite every year 10 young people coming from very different fields um, to work with me for two days in the week. And the other days they were working on their PhD. And so it was an interdisciplinary community. We even cooked together and ate together during these two days. And this was a great time. So why is this important for art and science? 
I had additional funds to invite every year for one semester, one scientist, one artist, and one writer. So that these young people, the 10 people, could interact not only with me, but they also had an artist in residence, a scientist in residence, a writer in, as in residence. And this served to broaden their horizon. And of course, it was very interesting also to see how artists, scientists, writers related to such an interdisciplinary group. Now, <clears throat> with the scientists, there were lots of strands of discussion, and uh, this was, as you would expect, in a scientific environment, it was fun to exchange and productive for everyone. Writers were a bit difficult because, as we found out and I found out, writers have their own standards of what is quality in literature. And they are rather, let me call it, slightly intolerant. If people come and do not have internalized the same standards of literature, in other words, if they are illiterate. <laughs> and so this was difficult. And with artists, um, I was able to choose young artists. Also, the budget was such that I preferred to choose younger artists. And there they mixed and mingled with, um, <clears throat> with the young PhDs and my, my uh, fellows there. And this was very interesting because the artist was one of them. And we had a lot of discussions also about the career and lives of artists and scientists. And I can only tell you um, the scientists uh, knew, you know, career prospects are always uncertain, you don't know. But compared to the uncertainty of an artist at the beginning of his or her career, you know, scientists have a wonderful life and wonderful prospects. So this was one of the <coughs> lessons that, that I learned. But of course, um, the <coughs> experience, the most important experience, of course, was to see where does art and science overlap? What are the differences in trying to reach the public, because this was part of the mission, you know, go out and bring in society, but also you go out and you talk to society, and what were the differences here? So this is actually the background. And what I want to do is to give you uh, two parts. The one first part is sort of a <clears throat> story of the historical continuities of science and art, how they were at first rather close together, how they separated, and where we stand now. And the second part has to do with giving you a reflection. I come from STS, Science Technology Studies, and with an STS perspective, you never take things just for granted, but you try to reflect what are the structures behind and how can you, in a way, unpack what you see up front <clears throat> and see what are the mechanisms that are driving it. Um, so I will also go into the reflective part. So this is a <clears throat> picture that probably all of you uh, are familiar with. It's Michelangelo's uh, creation <clears throat> of Adam and Eve and uh, in, the, in the Sistine Chapel in, in Rome. And the time of the Renaissance was one <clears throat> in which art and science were pretty much united. This year, we also celebrate the 500th year of death of Leonardo da Vinci. And Leonardo, in himself, in his work, he sort of embodies the best of art and science. He was an engineer as much as he was consulting with the military power, sometimes on both sides. And um, <clears throat> you know, he was really um, setting um, masterpieces, creating masterpieces in whatever he, he touched and, and observed. And the Renaissance is an interesting period also because um, what does Renaissance mean? It means rebirth. And the rebirth, the way how people experienced it at the time, 
was to be able to go back to antiquity, rediscover antiquity that had been more or less, you know, forgotten, left behind. Rome is full of monuments that are made of stones that were taken out of other monuments. So you have a continuous recycling of old stuff that gets put into what is being built at that period. And the same thing happens with the knowledge of antiquity that was taken out of the texts, Greek texts, Roman texts, that had been circulated and preserved through the Arabs. Um, and it was a rediscovery in, in Europe, these ancient texts. But instead of just looking at them as ancient texts, people were eager to take out, like the stones from the old monuments. You needed something for your building, so you went and you took it out from a rubble heap or from a ruin and you put it where you wanted to have it. And this created a very fertile ground in terms of creating new knowledge, a new outlook. And uh, instead of just looking at ancient texts as something that could not be questioned, people were using them and they were using them in the ways how they thought fit to do something new. So rebirth means you are not the same person when you are reborn. You come into a different environment, you react in different ways, and you create new knowledge. And that's also what innovation is about. And science and art, as you can also see here a little bit uh, later, library, uh, <clears throat> Europe is full of these old, wonderful libraries, very often in monasteries, but also in some castles. This was the storage place for knowledge. Much like Google today, you know, has everything somewhere stored. There were these books, very precious books, and they were housed in a beautiful architectural room. So it was this combination of beauty that people were looking for, but at the same time, knowledge being housed um, in, in beauty. And this, of course, again, is an old Greek idea, um, <clears throat> Greek uh, pre-modern science, as we would call it uh, today, was a combination of the good and the beautiful. How can you live a good life, but at the same time an admiration for beauty that was in nature, that was in the virtue in people and um, everywhere. And then <clears throat> we move forward and we reach modern science, Modern science does not happen from one day to the next. So Galileo, whom you can see here in a reproduction, um, a painter reimagining uh, Galileo, of course, uh, <clears throat> because we have only one or two portraits of, of Galileo himself of the time. Um, this was already the first installation of modern science having to assert itself. Now, what was the big deal about modern science? Modern science was standing up against the authorities of the time. And these were the church, in those days the Catholic church, because Lutheranism did not uh, <clears throat> uh, play a role as yet, and uh, the, the monarch, the rulers, the political rulers. So modern science had to assert its, uh, its authority and had to get its space of autonomy. Because the claim, and this was a very radical claim at the time, the claim was the laws of nature do not yield to the laws of the state, nor to the laws of the church. And that's where it gets tricky. Because can you say God's laws, which the church claims to be its laws, can you claim that the laws of nature that you scientists have found, discovered, writing formulas about, writing treatises about, is this something that you can assert without getting into trouble? And as you see, Galileo got into trouble and he barely <clears throat> you know, escaped um, um, a worse fate. Um, in the end, he managed uh, to live out his life in house arrest and um, it was a dangerous period. A little bit later, the struggle <clears throat> for uh, autonomy continued. 
Autonomy for science has always been relative autonomy. There is no absolute autonomy for science anywhere in history, nor today, nor in the future. But the relative autonomy has to be guarded. And this is the time when modern science, we speak about the institutionalization of modern science. You know, it gets recognized, it has structures, it can reproduce itself by selecting its own members who is going to be a part of the group, something that universities do until this day. Universities select who is going to be a university professor at whatever stage in their career. So this is part of the institutionalization of, of science. And in the beginning of the Royal Society in London, it's the best documented, but there were s similar academies in Paris, in Berlin, in various provincial towns <clears throat> all over, trying to get together people who were interested in this modern science. Nobody called them scientists in those days. They were called natural philosophers because they were dealing with nature and philosophy was all they had. So inquiring nature, um, <clears throat> but we see it as the beginning of, of modern science. And the Royal Society did something interesting in terms of negotiating with the monarchy <clears throat> um, to get this relative autonomy. So what was the deal? They said, look, um, we, <clears throat> as natural philosophers, we live by exchange of ideas. The idea of freedom of science and exchanging ideas goes back to the very beginning. We need to be in touch with our colleagues elsewhere. And if we want to send a letter to a colleague in Paris or a letter to a colleague in Berlin, no emails in those days, of course, you sent letters, it should not go through censorship. So it was to stand up against political censorship. Then <clears throat> there were some of them who were interested in, let's look inside the body. You know, we want to know how does the blood flow? What is inside a body? So the only way to do this, of course, was to get access to corpses and to do anatomy on corpses. But again, <clears throat> this was something that you had to get a special exemption to allow them to do that. It had to be done in a very secret way so that nobody would get upset, etc. And this was another privilege. And there were, were a few other privileges, but what did these people have to promise? What was it that the state wanted from them in exchange? Because a deal is always on both sides. So the state wanted them not to meddle in theology, this was taboo, nor in politics, another taboo. And the Royal Society said, we will not meddle in politics, we will not meddle in theology, we will not meddle in rhetoric, which was another taboo. So this was the deal on both sides, and it should give you an idea about the relative autonomy of modern science as it started way back um, at that time in, in, in the 17th century. Now, <clears throat> modern science, and again I go back to the Royal Society because it's, as I said, the best documented case we have. They um, set up, they, they had two innovations. They came up with two basic innovations in the sense that they said, well, <clears throat> we only will make progress in exploring nature <clears throat> if we are able to experiment. So the idea of setting up an experiment was born in those days. You had uh, Francis Bacon before who died because he was doing experiments and he got a, um, a, a um, <clears throat> pneumonia while he was uh, experimenting with his frozen chicken. Uh, and things of this kind. So where there were all kinds of people doing experiments, but this was for the first time that this was recognized, this is our way of m working. Now, what does an experiment allow you to do? It allows you to shield against external influences that you do not want to interfere. You control in the lab 
whatever you can control. You have to measure, you have your dependent variable, your independent variable. You want to know precisely what you want to look for. And so it gives you this control in a confined space. And then <clears throat> you could see what is the outcome. So we are all familiar with experiments and the history of experiments, um, etc. But the Royal Society had another innovation, a social innovation that went with it. They said it's not enough that you do this in your lab because the alchemists had done it before. You know, the alchemists worked in great secret, trade secrets. You would not tell anyone what you had found. And now all of a sudden science became open. It was performed in lab in a lab, but not everyone could go and watch. So how can we make sure, first of all, that it's open, but also that we can invite people to witness what we are seeing? So this was the first way how scientists, as we call them today, would interact with the public. Now, you see here one of the um, reconstructions of one famous experiment, and Simon Schaeffer, historian of, of um, science, has written a wonderful book on Leviathan and the air pump, precisely on this experiment only. Um, these experiments had to be re-performed in public. So first you did it in the lab, but then you had to come out in public. You set up uh, your, your stage here, you were performing your experiment, but you needed witnesses. So the witnesses in those days were gentlemen. And gentlemen means no women. But it was not so much because they distrusted women. You see some women here were present, but women could not function as a witness for the simple reason because they were not considered to be economically independent. They were economically dependent on their fathers or on their husbands. And a gentleman was someone who was economically independent, who had his own means of <coughs> uh, carrying out his, his life, because only then could you be a witness because you were independent. And then you could say, yes, we see what you have done with your air pump, and we believe and witness that the outcome is what you told us to be. So this is <coughs> one of the innovations <coughs> that started at the very beginning. Relationship to the public, but also um, inviting the public to witness something. Now, science has since then moved on. And scientists were very much concerned, and they are concerned about it to this very day that their findings are objective. And you have heard the word objectivity probably more often than you may have wanted to hear it when you are told, is this really objective enough? And what is the basis for you claiming it to be objective, etc.? Now, this is an old, old concern because in the early days, people did not know, can we trust our senses? Is that what we see? Is this really telling us what nature does, how nature works, or is it just our senses that tell us something? And this kept bothering people very much. And then they came up with the idea, and uh, Rainy Daston and Peter Gallison have written a very nice book about it, the history of objectivity. Objectivity has a social history. It's not something that fell from the sky or that came out of a lab. It has a social history because it's connected with people, with scientists who are striving to get objectivity. So in the beginning, people to get, how can you get over? So first you say, you know, I let you witness. But then after some time they say, well, you know, these nice gentlemanly uh, gatherings are not enough. We want further proof that what we do is really valid and can be reproduced. That's what science is all about. So they started to look for uh, drawings. The printing press helped them greatly in doing that because in drawings you could compare. 
So you would draw a flower in the plant, you would compare it with another plant that had been found elsewhere. Is it the same or is it not the same? And you had a basis, an objective basis, to start to compare what people were doing. Later on, in a, in a later phase, um, this became what we call a mechanical objectivity. You were trusting the measurements on your equipment. You know, it said, and equipments had to be standardized, of course. So you did, um, <clears throat> you were trusting the, um, the equipment and the mechanical indicators on your equipment. And then came a third phase that um, Dustin and um, Gallison call the trained judgment. Um, looking, you know, at um, if, if you ever go to an um, observatory, um, you will see people don't look at the sky, they look at their computer screen. And, um, you know, and they're all the intermediate steps be between the big interferometer watching what happens in the sky and in distant galaxies to get to the data that you see on your computer screen. But you have to be able to interpret your data. And that's where the trained judgment comes in. And probably now we are moving on to a next phase where we have um, machine learning algorithms that uh, are very good at finding patterns and still, you know, we are needed to interpret at least the cases that are doubtful. So let me move on to the 19th century, uh, the century of patronage of both science and the arts. And somewhere around that time, we see a splitting of art and science going different ways. Before, <clears throat> also in the collections of the aristocracy, the great patrons, both of science and the arts, were the aristocracy collecting everything. They had so-called wonder chambers, Wunderkammer, where they would show <coughs> their collections to their friends, to their competitors. Um, uh, and these collections are still around. They're wonderful uh, material for, for historians of science and of the arts. And you could see how closely the two went uh, one together with the other. And then we see a differentiation happening here because uh, science sponsorship and patronage was largely taken over by the state, interested in military prowess, interested in industrialization. And this was the monopoly of the, of the state. Um, and in the competition between European powers, you had Britain, you had France, you had Germany, you had a few others. Um, it was important to uh, sponsor science and to fund science with the um, Humboldt University here, the first research-based university, um, as something. And the patronage of uh, the arts was somewhere left on the side because uh, this was not the primary interest of the, of the state. They wanted to put ma their money into industry and into uh, the, the military part of, of industry. So, and this is here where the bourgeoisie, the upcoming bourgeoisie, middle class, um, that went through the educational system at uh, that time, and they were filling the state bureaucracy. They were competing with the aristocracy and slowly pushing the aristocracy aside, also in terms of being a patron of the arts. And uh, you had um, already before, you know, the women were the, the, the ladies who were opening their salons uh, to have interesting conversations going on in their homes. And you had um, <clears throat> the bourgeoisie, as I said, uh, competing here. And also how you would become a scientist and artist became something where you had to go to university or to an art school. You could not just say, you know, I'm a scientist um, and I can do this or that. You needed to be certified. So also, from the second half of the 19th century onwards, we have universities that are certifying people 
to be able to enter a scientific career. And something similar happened for the arts. There were still better ways of getting in from the sides and having niches. But by and large, um, <clears throat> this is also that time. So let's make a big jump to where we are now. So where is science today in a public space? Well, <clears throat> you can point to all the labs that you have here on campus and elsewhere in the world. But is this a public space? Can you just enter a lab and say, you know, here I am. I'm a gentleman or a gentlewoman. I want to see what you are doing. No way. So science has been removed from the public space in the way how it used to be. And it has become part of a specialized uh, space. And this puts a burden or a challenge on scientists because you still have to communicate with the public. You have to communicate with your funders. You have to be part of society. And today scientists are very much aware of this necessity. But the question is how? Let's look at art in public space? Well, art fares much better because we have museums. So the previous private collections of the aristocracy, the private collections of the bourgeoisie, when, you know, fortunes changed, they ended up in museums. And museums became public spaces, inviting people to come, to look, and to educate the public. So from this point of view, science has a problem, and art, let's say, does not have the same problem. It may have other problems. But this is the relation to public space. And so out of this necessity, you know, how can we reach the public? I come to something that I call performing in the public uh, domain today. And performing, performance, performativity is something that is very much part of the STS conceptual um, um, way of speaking and of understanding what goes on. Because um, performance, if you speak about performance and performativity, it allows you not just to look at a text or not just to look at an artifact and describe it. It allows you to see what people do the actual practices of people. And this is one of the strengths, in my view, of an STS approach, because it allows you to examine what are the ways how people, institutions, certain subgroups of people at certain periods present themselves, perform themselves uh, towards an audience. The audience varies, and so will the performance vary. But nevertheless, it allows you to get a, a good conceptual handle and empirical grip into what do people actually do. So we have <clears throat> performing in the public uh, domain today. You have uh, museums, universities. Very often, they have a public open day. So they invite the public, but it's one day out of the entire year. But they open their laboratories. You have special weeks of science. You have arts festivals. You have science festivals. This is something where scientists go out, present their, um, <clears throat> their findings, get people interested. And this is one way of relating. But again, <clears throat> and people have looked at it, the problem comes. Um, First of all, who comes to these festivals? Very often it's parents with their children or school teachers with their children. So children are enthusiastic. They like what they see. They get all excited. But at the same time, remind you, children are a captive audience. You know, They go with their parents. They go with their teachers to wherever the parents and teachers think they should go. And then the problem comes, what happens to these enthusiastic kids afterwards? You know, is there someone in the schools, at home, that takes up where the enthusiasm of the children has left them after visiting such a festival or talking to a scientist and coming back? 
Uh, in, in Europe, we have something that is um, by now fairly widespread. It's called um, the University for Children. So at the end of the academic year, um, many universities uh, ask their teaching staff, would you be willing to volunteer for one more week? And um, they invite children to come for one week to the university as the place in order to deepen you know, the, the knowledge that they could take with them from these places where they were first encountering what, what excited them. And then, of course, you have by now um, a very productive and creative fringe. You have hackers and hacker spaces, maker spaces. You have all kinds of arts, design, media, a bit everywhere in a very productive, chaotic way. And um, again, you know, we have to ask ourselves, well, you know, how far does it spread into society? And here again, taking digital media as something that has become the everyday language of communicating for us today. Uh, you can, of course, uh, use the internet. Many people use it as a, as a source and um, don't even know anymore that libraries exist because everything is to be found on the internet, they believe. And <clears throat> you have all kinds of um, very easy ways of getting to information, which means, in my opinion, that um, answers are much cheaper than in previous times. To get an answer before, you know, you had to go to the library, you had to consult books, you had to talk to people who knew about it to get an answer, now it's all there. So if answers get much cheaper, I would say questions get more precious. To ask good questions, and this is something for the students here in the room, to ask good questions is becoming something that is very challenging. And it has to do with this shifting imbalance between answers and, and questions that we get through this. But to come back to the question, this communication, this outreach and interaction with the public, what does it actually accomplish? Impact is much too much a formula to catch it, what is happening. And uh, <clears throat> we have also great uh, reservations in how you can measure the impact of social sciences and humanities, because you have a time lag, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But um, <clears throat> what we see so far is in all these events, you have largely a self-selective audience. You have younger people, you have people who are curious, people who are innovative, they want to learn. And to measure successful outreach is, is difficult, even if you have such books uh, like that by network scientists, um, uh, Barabashi, um, with this flashy title, The Formula, and I'm sure Many of you want to read this now. It tells you how to be successful in science. But not only in science, um, also in the arts. Um, but to make a long story uh, short, he says um, we have to <clears throat> distinguish success from uh, recognition. And from you know, the talents, you can, <clears throat> you can be recognized for what you do, and it's not measurable but you can measure success as you know, how many clicks you get, um, how many people cite your work, etc. So this is the easy part. But then there is the other part um, of, of you <coughs> being valued as an individual in terms of um, your achievements. You can be a disabled person sitting in a wheelchair, and the next morning you are able to move your hand or your leg. And for you, this is a big, big success. It's a big progress. And we have to recognize this also as being human achievements. But it's different from this kind of success. So I'm coming, <clears throat> I still have some time. Yes, um, I'm coming towards um, <clears throat> the end of my first part. You know, where are the spaces today? I've taken you from the um, <clears throat> or <a> society <clears throat> kind of public experiment to um, 
the labs and the museums and the hacker spaces today, but where are the public spaces today in an environment that gets denser, that gets more and more urbanized, the projections that more than three quarters of humanity very soon will live in kind of mega cities, you know, tell us what the future on this earth will be like. We continue to grow, but the earth is finite in terms of space. So <clears throat> our cities become denser. This means you have fewer public spaces, you have more restricted and more regulated public spaces. So where can art, science meet uh, the public? And <clears throat> of course we have expanded the space by the digital, the cyberspace. And <clears throat> many people not finding the physical space anymore, they escape to cyberspace. They find their friends there, they chat there, the, etc. But is this enough or do we still need the physical spaces, physical encounters, interactions of persons and not just um, in, in um, virtual interactions? And here <coughs> at NTU, alas not on the campus here but in town in the Gilman barracks, you have a beautiful space where art science can meet the public, namely the Center for Contemporary uh, Art. And those of you who have not been there as yet, I urge you to go. They do wonderful things. So let me now come um, to, the, to, to, to the reflection on what I've shared uh, with you. So I told you continuities and you know how one thing builds on the other, leaving out many, many details, of course. But I think I gave you a, a storyline of where we started and where we are now in the 21st uh, century. But you know, let's do a bit of reflection on, on what we have seen. And <clears throat> to reflect, um, <clears throat> uh, I want to bring in memory and, and forgetting. And there is a very, um, almost a weird little book uh, <clears throat> by um, David uh, Eagleman. It was written some 10 years ago. And Eagleman was thinking what happens in afterlife and what are people's ideas about what happens in afterlife. So he came up with 40 different stories, very short stories, partly his invention, partly, you know, taking image imaginaries that exist in the public in different ways, mixing it together. But there's one story that um, I, I find interesting. And this one story says, well, <clears throat> you know, when people die, they come into a kind of uh, limbo. It's, it's like a huge um, um, space in an airport. You can no longer get out and no one can come in, so you are there. And you are, you're dead, so you are in this airport space. And people are allowed to leave only if nobody remembers them anymore. So it's a curious idea, but if you think of it, you know, what happens? Well, people are remembered as long as their family, their friends talk about them, remember them. If that happens, they're allowed to go. But then there are other people who keep on being remembered, like Aristotle or Galileo. <laughs> so they have to stay there and they are stuck. So I find this an interesting idea about forgetting and memory. And lo and behold, you know, people also, um, you know, social scientists have taken this up because this is an old topic for social scientists, you know, memory, uh, memory and, and forgetting and remembrance. And <clears throat> these people here have done, um, <clears throat> they have looked at uh, half a million paper in physics published physics paper. They have looked at, I don't know how many uh, thousands of sports people's biographies. They've looked at all kinds of data and they wanted to know when are people forgotten. And, you know, following the line of forgetting people, authors, sports people, famous people who once were famous, you know, when are they forgotten? Now what they found, and this is where math is very helpful, 
uh, it shows you first there is a strong drop <coughs> over time. But then at one point it stops and it goes in a very slow curve. It's called bioexponential curve uh, function in, in, in mass. And the way how they interpret it is we have two different kinds of memories, we as, as, as human beings. One is the communicative memory. It's like in the story, as long as somebody talks about you, you are remembered. This is the communicative memory. But then comes the memory where no one is around anymore. You know, the, the likes of Galileo no longer exist since a long time. So then it becomes a kind of archival memory. And you need physical ways of storing the information, of remembering. You need stones, you need texts, you need all kinds of materials for this long memory. And <clears throat> this leads me to another reflection that I would say um, put under the question, when it was humanity allowed to forget? Now, it comes with three major inventions in the history of humanity. The invention of writing, major step forward for our brains as uh, <clears throat> people working in uh, paleology and, and genetics tell us. Things happen in the brain the way how it is wired if you are able to read, if you are able to write. The brain functions and is wired in a different way than if you are not. Um, but it also <clears throat> was liberating people from having to remember all these stories that you could not write down. So it made room for something new, but of course there were also losses. And Plato famously complained bitterly what writing does to the loss of memory and the cognitive faculties. Today we hear similar complaints. You know, the, taxi, the famous taxi drivers in London who have stored the map of London in their brain. Um, <clears throat> they will be wiped out by Uber and the likes because you don't have to remember anymore the place. Kids no longer able to read a map because, you know, you have it all and it tells you go right and in 20 meters turn, turn left. So we have these losses. But at the same time, you know, it allows you to do other things. And <clears throat> it can be liberating. The invention of writing allowed most likely geometry to start because people could write down measuring, you know, the famous triangle and the hypotenuse, etc. You could write it down. You could remember things and share them in a way that is more accurate, etc. The um, <clears throat> printing press, as I mentioned before, uh, with the true to nature designs, you know, that helped very much. Experimental sciences also, because now you would have a document documenting what you were doing in an experiment and <clears throat> you could compare the accuracy. So all this was facilitated by the printing press and so was mass education. Without the printing press, this led to the distribution of books, of being able to interpret, people were able to read for themselves, discuss what they had read, um, all this is, is known. And <clears throat> now we have uh, reached <clears throat> the stage of digitalization. <clears throat> and the question is, what, um, what do we want to keep and what needs to be thrown away? And with this enormous amount of data that we have now, this is the question of the day, I would say. You know, What can we keep? Not everything. Don't be... <clears throat> fall into the illusion that just because we have new storage capacities, everything can be kept. It cannot be kept, partly because of material fatigue, partly for other reasons. So someone has to step in and say, we need to make a decision what to keep and what not to keep, and on what basis. Now, there are people who have done this as a profession, and the whole professional life consists in doing precisely that. These are the librarians and the archivists and people working in museums. 
that continuously have to confront this question, what to forget out, what to keep, keep in, and why, and which criteria. So <clears throat> information makes uh, forgetting possible. And <clears throat> science has vastly expanded what we know. But let's remain humble. There are always limits to the knowledge of the age in which we live. If you would live in ancient Greece or ancient China, your worldview, your knowledge was limited by everything material, ideological, philosophical, religious of that particular age and period and place. And the same <clears throat> pertains to the Middle Ages in, in Europe. And the same pertains to us today. We don't know as yet um, what future generations will discover. So we have these limits. And it's good to be reminded and to be somewhat humble about uh, the limits of our knowledge. But one major change that has occurred rather recently is that science is no longer only out there. Science is now in us. And this comes with digitalization. It comes with the way how we will have wearables on our body, how we will have fitness trackers that tell <clears throat> you know, to the uh, machine learning algorithm, how we feel in the morning and whether our blood pressure is okay, etc., etc. I will not go into the details, you know it all. So we have science that is already in us. So science is everywhere and it makes us see everything that science sees at that uh, point in time in which we are. And <clears throat> the, this is where I want to bring in art again. You know, look at the colors of, that you see on the left uh, side. These are, of course, all fake colors. Everything you know, coming from outer space. And we see all these pictures, and they come in color because we are good in reproducing colors. But of course, they are not the real colors. They are colors that are borrowed from art. If you look at this, and if you think of old paintings, you find you know, there's an aesthetic similarity here, um, and you find forms that come up in the way how science is visualized and communicated that you find also in art. And for me, this is one of the unexpected discoveries of art and science, how they are connected. And we sort of have internalized these artistic forms. I would not call it beauty, but there are certain forms that are pleasing, that we want to share, to reproduce, etc. And the same goes uh, for colors and, and the like. And modern design, you know, helps to bring this out um, even stronger. So science has become part of our body. And <clears throat> we see and experience through these kind of images that come and are delivered by science for us. And this is interesting insofar as um, experiments in science can now be experienced by us because they are part of our bodies and have become part of our bodies. And in the early days, scientists were doing a lot of self-experiments because it was easier to do an experiment on yourself. You would write down how you felt in the morning. Sometimes it ended not so well, but by and large, you know, these were courageous people driven by their curiosity and passion for science. But now I feel we are all becoming self-experimenting human beings because we get this input and we experience what science gives us, but we start to experiment ourselves. So again, this is an unexpected loop that, uh, that comes back. So I come to my, <clears throat> to my uh, last point and my, my reflection, and I, I thought quite, about, uh, quite a bit about it. Um, <clears throat> and I would just insert the way shaping in here, defining and shaping <clears throat> the relationship, how to bring 
science, art, and ourselves together. And I would claim that science, largely science, defines and shapes our relationship with reality. There may still be some people who believe in a flat earth and so on, but by and large, you know, it's a scientific worldview that has taken over the way how we experience reality. And then we live more and more in a world that is reinforced through all the digital media, where it's media, it's business, that markets that define our relationship with each other. So what is left for us, you know, for our relationship to ourselves? And I would say this is where art comes in. Art has the potential to shape <clears throat> and to question our relationship to science, media, and markets, and to ourselves. And it all comes down to this very simple question, what does it mean to be human? And <clears throat> this is part of the subversive power <clears throat> that art has, and also where art differs very much from science. It works on our senses, but in a different way. It questions and has the ability to question <clears throat> our relationship defined by science, media, and the markets. But at the same time, art uses science. It uses markets and the media for its own purposes. This is why, you know, art incorporates digital design, etc. It's, it's very um, eclectic in taking up whatever suits <clears throat> the artistic imagination and it uses and, 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 and exploits it. So, <clears throat> Helen mentioned my book, The Cunning of Uncertainty, in the beginning. I'm ending with uncertainty. <clears throat> the future remains uncertain. And <clears throat> the Uncertainty is nothing to shirk away from. Uncertainty is a very forceful driver in wanting us to venture into territory that is yet unknown. And <clears throat> I've been arguing that um, we need to embrace uncertainty and not retract in fear or in negative um, ways of seeing the world and giving up because fear you know stifles every initiative it draws you puts you into a corner and you can no longer imagine the future and it is important for us to be able to imagine the future because only then and art can help us in doing that only then can we actually do something about it with this i want to end and thank you all for your attention Thank, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> you know, this first kind of, um, this, this deal, it's, it's very fundamental the way how scientists have internalized it. 
so if you speak to scientists, they all want to make a clear cut, this is politics and this is science. And science has nothing to do with politics. Now, on one level, this is correct. But at another level, and this is where social science research, STS, comes in, we see how much science and politics have been intertwined. Historical examples, present day examples, you cannot just make this very clear cut. But for scientists, it's important to have this kind of ethos. We have not, we don't deal with politics. We are scientists. And in a way, <clears throat> it helps to protect them. But in another way, <clears throat> you know, it makes them somewhat blind to the realities that we face today. Because uh, science is so much intertwined with all kinds of interests, industrial, business interests, uh, state interests, uh, etc. This is part of the reality how science works today. Yeah? And so <clears throat> this also means that um, in relationship to the public, you said, uh, you know, they should spell out the implications. Now, <clears throat> I agree, but there, is, there are two problems with this. First of all, the implications are not that clear cut. There were some instances like, you know, the Union of Concerned Scientists, a famous grouping that uh, rose from the people who were building the atomic bomb. And after they saw <clears throat> what the atomic bomb, you know, was unleashing in, uh, when it was dropped in Japan in 1945, you know, they got together and said, um, <clears throat> you know, we have to do something for this never to happen again. And uh, so the Union of Concerned Scientists um, that continues today, you may have seen, they, they have a publication called the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and they have this doomsday clock. You know, from time to time you see we are now, I think, two minutes before midnight and then, you know, everything will, <clears throat> uh, the catastrophe uh, will, will set in. So we don't, so this was one instance where scientists say, you know, we have seen the implications, the enormous amount of catastrophic horror that can be unleashed by an atomic bomb. We don't want this to happen again. But very often, the implications are not clear at all, not even to the people who work at the source. They have sometimes a concern, but then it is surrounded by so many uncertainties that come from our inability to see uh, and understand the unintended consequences of human action. We see only so far <clears throat> where our actions will have consequences. But then many consequences arise from interactions between what we do. Our, you know, our actions go in many different directions, have many different implications. This is what complexity and complex systems are all about. You, know? you have emergent properties in such a system that arises from interactions that you don't see, that you cannot control that no one is able to foresee, and it just allows you to model, uh, you know, some of these instances. But at the same time, I think your questions highlights the importance of entering a kind of dialogue with the public. And instead of just saying, you know, we have nothing to do with it, uh, <clears throat> and shutting themselves off in, in a laboratory to engage in public dialogue. And this is something that, Originally, scientists were very, very reluctant to do. And I have personally followed in my, in my work also a number of these controversies that uh, <clears throat> were in uh, Europe and in, in the United States. The first one concerning uh, nuclear energy. Now, there was a major backlash against using nuclear power as an energy source mainly because of the unresolved problem, what to do with nuclear waste. And <clears throat> these controversies were very, um, you know, harsh confrontations. And scientists involved um, at first said, if we only inform the public, you know, the public will understand. We tell them 
it's not that dangerous. You know, we can do this and that, and we can make more safe reactors, and we have found a new way of storing uh, the waste material in <coughs> uh, among certain mountains in, in Finland uh, or in, uh, in, in Germany, wherever. Um, but then the public did not buy it. And what was interesting was that uh, you had a kind of um, discussion going on which are the proper risk assessment models to use. So, it's, you know, the, the discussion was not just yes and no, but you had some scientists who moved, if you want, to the side of the public, and they said, um, we also see problems with this kind of, of energy. And <clears throat> so there was an interesting shift in, in alliance as well. But then what was interesting in is that the actual risk models used has been changed through the controversy. In the beginning, scientists were using the old risk model that goes back to the steam engine in, in, in a way. You look at what is the probability of an accident and you multiply it with uh, the damage that will be good. It's, it's an old formula and they were using this as well for nuclear power. And um, people in the public said, this is not the same, you know. We cannot see radioactivity. You cannot sniff it. You, you don't know where it is. And if radioactivity, um, you know, wipes out a hospital or schools, is this really the same like any other figure that you put into your model? Or should we not distinguish? Then came another argument. Um, life is risky. If you get into your car, you know, you know you may have an accident. But radioactivity is something, it's, it's not visible. So you are not voluntarily saying, I'm willing to be exposed to it. So they had to factor that in. And then whether you voluntarily enter a risk or not became one of the defining characteristics of this different, um, you know, modeling exercises that, that went on. So then more or less something similar happened with genetically modified organisms, yeah? And again, you had a raging controversy. And um, scientists again said, well, first they said, well, purely informing the public is no longer enough. We, we, we know that. They don't listen to us, and somehow they may have other concerns. So let's listen to their concerns. And the discussion became a bit more um, willing to listen to why are people against genetically modified organisms. And I was at ETH Zurich at that time, when in Switzerland, um, the Swiss do referendum all the time. It's not like Brexit. The Swiss are excellent in doing referendums and they know what to do with them. So uh, they had a referendum on genetically modified organism at that time. And scientists got very worried because, uh, you know, if it's no, it's no, and what, what do we do? So um, there was also a study that was done on risk aversion in the French-speaking part, Switzerland is multilingual, but they have a geographic distribution. You have a German-speaking part, a Swiss, an Italian, and a Romance-speaking part. So a study was done on risk um, aversion in the population, in the German-speaking part and in the French-speaking part. And the outcome was, well, they are much more risk averse in the German-speaking part. Well, the French are, you know, they like risk. So how do you explain this? It has to do with culture. You know, French are more lively and, you know, risk is something they get excited about. All wrong, all wrong. The reason was that in the German-speaking part, you have a vast patch of agriculture. And the farmers were afraid of Monsanto and similar firms moving in where they have to buy the seeds every year. In the French-speaking part, you have mountains. You have very little agriculture. So the French could not care less. And you have to find out, you know, what are the reasons of people why they are for or against something. So again, you know, this was an interesting outcome of this uh, discussion. And so 
scientists have become much more aware that unless you go out, you speak to people, you do focus groups sometimes, uh, also in the life sciences, you know, what, uh, what should we do? Um, and, and people learn a lot about it um, on the science side and also on, on the public side. And this has now become something um, that scientists have really understood and are willing uh, to, to, to practice. This is the public side. Now, talking with government and talking with um, industry is, uh, is another story, of course. And uh, with industry, we have part of the problem, especially in the life sciences, that hits back to uh, what we call research integrity these days. You know, nobody has any interest in no longer being able to trust your findings. But if you're funded by a company, your credibility is at stake. Whether you bias your study or not is a second question. But your credibility is at stake. And this is why, by now, most academic journals require the authors who submit articles to state the source of their funding and to declare, you know, do I have a conflict of interest with um, this company that funds my research? You can still do it, you can, but you have to put it in, you have to be um, uh, transparent about it. And that's one way of, of dealing with it. So long answer to your very good question. Thank you. Please. Uh, thanks for the for the talk. It was uh, very inspirational. So it got me thinking apart when at the end of the storyline of how science exposure to the public was changing, you said that science in the modern stage is not open to the public anymore and it's more into specialized areas, right? And I, I got me thinking that I think that maybe now Historically, it's the period where the public has the most easy access mm -hmm. to science mm -hmm. on their hands. So maybe people doesn't have to be present there, but they can just watch a TED talk or watch videos on YouTube, yeah. access to MOOCs from mm -hmm. professors at yeah. different universities, Wikipedia. So that, that would be kind of like an opposing view to the fact that people have no access to science nowadays. And maybe people have actually most access to science that there has ever, has ever been in history. So then, in that context, what would be the message to us as scientists? Well, uh, you, you are certainly right. Um, you know, we have never lived in a time where we had so many well-educated people and well-informed people in the whole history of, of, of humanity. At the same time, you know, we have the problem of trustworthiness also of these sources. And um, doctors experienced it early on <clears throat> when you know, the first uh, Wikipedia and internet searches became available to most of the, the public. Doctors were confronted with the patient coming and saying, you know, I have this disease because I found it on the internet and you want to treat me with this, but you know, this source says this is not good for me. So, you know, doctors learned how to cope with it. But in the beginning, you know, it was shocking for them and for their authority. Yeah? And um, <clears throat> as you know, um, if you follow the um, uh, one of the well-documented uh, controversy about uh, tobacco and uh, tobacco causing lung cancer. You know. And by now we know, because this has been studied in great detail by Naomi Oreskes and her co-author, um, <clears throat> we know that the tobacco industry used a very clever strategy in utilizing every scientific study that was published. And whenever you know, a study left a bit of doubt, and most good scientific articles never say this is the final certainty. You know, they say, under this condition, you know, uh, we think that it may be. So there are all these cautious words thrown in. But the tobacco industry seized on that and said, look, they are not even sure about it. 
Yeah? So this was an ongoing, uh, very you know, ugly battle that was fought against science on the part of tobacco industry. So the question is of trustworthiness. And how can we also um, educate the public, educate young people to be more critical about the sources and how to uh, judge what is trustworthy or not. It, it starts with the, the kind of information that has nothing to do with science per se. You know, it's uh, political, it's uh, all kinds of information. You cannot just suck it in, you have to um, tell kids, you know, find out is this credible, is it not? How do you find out, is it credible or not, etc. And this is why in science we have peer review. And peer review with all the, <clears throat> you know, negative flaws, we, we have nothing better than peer review. And um, this is the mechanism in which science itself uh, controls the credibility. And some of this, you know, has to be um, also injected into the public mind there are ways of ascertaining, don't believe everything just because it says it's a scientific study. Can I ask us yeah. A yeah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's fascinating that you talk about peer review as being, you know, the, the bastion of, of reasoning or the bastion of knowledge. <laughs> I said yet, we have nothing better. <laughs> but this is also uh, where knowledge is gatekeeped, right? In order to access yeah. these yeah. articles, in order to yeah. access this knowledge, and so, you know, if we have things like open access where yeah. that payment is on us when we publish, if we would like for it to be publicly accessible, uh, where this is actually supposed to be the best knowledge, yeah. yet that's the only knowledge that the public can access. Um, so what's the way forward when, when we discuss things like public engagement with science when the best knowledge is actually held back from the public? Well, as, as you know, it's an ongoing battle. Uh, in Europe now we have Plan S, you know, open science, and there has been a boycott of Elsevier in all German publicly funded um, universities and projects because they say um, we are for open science. And most of the major funding agencies now have signed up to open access. So the last word is still out, the jury is still out, but uh, people are reacting to it in the way how you, uh, your, your comment implies they should react. Because um, all studies that are published have been funded with public money, more or less. And then to ask a second time uh, the authors to pay for something, they have been paid for and worked in, it's just uh, unsustainable and it uh, is unjust. But I don't know about the discussion regarding open access here in Singapore at all, but I know that the major funding agencies in Europe, in the US, the Wellcome Trust in the UK, which has more money in the life sciences than the government gives for the life sciences, they have signed up to open, uh, to open access. Could I just yeah. It seems like the idea of a democratization of science mm -hmm. uh, is limited to on the other side of the equation by by issues of inequality, say in the area of education. Yeah. Um, so that you know the idea that um, just anybody can go to Google. And yeah. that, that's not necessarily true. So, for example, if uh, artificial intelligence is going to bring about job losses, the very, that particular sector of the population are not the ones who are participating I in agree. discussions about this, for example. I, I agree, you know, the, it's called the digital divide. There's also the genomic divide because uh, more and more, um, you know, we see a shift in medicine towards the analysis of genomic data, and if people have no clue, uh, you know, what it's all about, they will be left out and marginalized. So this is up to the state, civil society, schools, 
Um, but I, I can only say, yes, we have to acknowledge the, divi the, the digital divide exists, the genomic divide exists, and we have to try not to end up in a situation where we have an elite part in society with all the privileges that any elite has, and the rest of the population let, uh, uh, is, is left behind. There was a, a question back I'm, I'm sorry. No, uh, I mean, we, we have to realize it's, it's, it's a transition phase. Every publishing house is confronted with it. The research funding agencies are confronted with it. Scientists are confronted with it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, um, I have been following uh, the, the stress of the peer review system in general. And I think the peer review system is really bursting at, this, at its seams. And we have to do something uh, to change the model of, not, not the idea of peer review, but the way how we do it. And my uh, solution is a very simple one. I think by 2030, we should have the number of publications, full stop. And this will bring better quality because people will concentrate on, you know, the real findings that they want to, to publish and it will alleviate the, the reviewing system. So that's my solution. <laughs> I've got a, a bit of a different direction. Mm. In a sense, some of the things you're saying is if we just tell people the uh, empirical truth uh, or scientific uh, yeah. facts mm. as much as we can, yeah. then everything will go so well. No. No, because, no. for example, the anti-vax... No, 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 no. And this confirmation no, bias. That's, that's what I tried to say. Sorry yeah. if it did not come through as clearly. This was what scientists thought in the beginning, yeah. and it utterly failed. Mm. So pure information changes nobody's behavior. Full stop. Mm. Yes? So you have to engage with people. You have to find out what are their concerns. Um, now, with anti-vax, it's a, it's, it's a big problem, and we have not found a solution as yet, because you have this very tricky, these are educated people, they read everything they can get their, their eyes on, um, but of course they do it in a very selective way. But you have this um, ethical dilemma, I would say, and dilemmas are dilemmas, so you don't know what to do. Uh, the dilemma, I protect my child against possible negative effects, but at the same time I hurt the community. Yeah? And this is what goes on in their minds. You need a herd uh, immunity, you need, depending on the disease, up to 60 or 80 or even 90 percent in some cases, of immunization in the population if you want to have a protection. So, you can say it's everyone's duty as a member of the community to get vaccinated. Yeah? Or you can say, you know, I have individual choice. You know, I'm an individual and I don't care about the community. I only care about my child. And that's the ethical dilemma. So um, in some cases um, in, in Europe, in some countries, there is, uh, vaccination is obligatory, so you don't even get to the point, can you choose or not. And in some cases, it's not obligatory, but you have um, 
more or less um, means, I mean, you say we will not admit the child to a public school to protect our children that are in a public school. And public school have a higher prestige in some countries than you cannot compare it to the, to the US where it would be the reverse, you know. Um, <clears throat> so there are different ways of dealing with it uh, country by country, but it, it is a big problem. But information itself just does not work. And people's concerns you only find out by, by talking to them, by listening to them. Um, by trying to to somehow take it on board, but uh, there are some groups in society, regardless of how much you talk to them, regardless which arguments uh, you bring, it's a lost cause and don't waste your time. Yeah. I wonder if I could um, go back sort of to the main theme of, of um, the presentation on science. Because mm -hmm. so far the questions yeah. really haven't touched yes. on art. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I, and I think in many places art is seen as something that's a, sort of after mm -hmm. the science is mm -hmm. dominant and science yeah. is the first thing and then art is the nice to have or art is the communicative tool. But as you put it, artists are asking the question, what does it mean to be human? So it seems like those are questions that need to be more integral to the, yeah. to, to the, to the process of, of knowledge. Yeah. No, um, <clears throat> I think um, there are, you know, one of the, the differences goes back to my experience with my, with my Collegium Helveticum, you know, and uh, having um, a young artist, uh, young artists amongst us, plus exhibitions, etc. Artists are, and here it differs from science, artists um, invite the public to ask questions but they don't give you necessarily any definite answers. And if you ask questions from the scientist, you expect and you get an answer. May not be the answer you like or you want, but you get an answer. And that's a, that's a fundamental difference. So in art also you have something that is called irony. In science you cannot be ironic. There's no, no place for it yes, in the way how you think about it or write about it. So there are these differences. And it's all part of being human. And we have to bring in this playful side, this um, tolerance of ambiguity. You know, scientists are not good in tolerating ambiguity. They have difficulties. And for artists, they, they thrive in being ambiguity because it can be this way, it can be that way, and it opens up the space of imagination. So, uh, I mean, there are, of course, um, collaborations that have been set up, but very often it amounts to inviting an artist to come in a lab and work. It. So it's, it's good for the understanding there, and then scientists understand better what artists do and vice versa. Then you can have an exhibition uh, reaching to the public, um, etc. All this is fine, but you know I, I think we need we need more of of it. And um, one way, of course, is to you know there are some experiments going on allowing um, a scientist also to go to an art school and vice versa. So I don't know what the outcome will be, but uh, in order to familiarize yourself with another way of thinking and approaching the world. But I think in, in design, you know, a lot of this can come together. We have the last question. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Um, I came here because I was interested in um, artistic research. And um, there were some moments that I knew of just where art and science and social came together in academia, which was places like uh, the Black Mountain College, the Bauhaus. Or, mm -hmm. So my question to you is, we always seem to talk about how we could do something and what are the things of engagement, but in, in, in application, uh, is it possible that a place like Antio, because we would now mm -hmm. be coming here from New York, 
I feel like we are performing a certain role <laughs> in academia. And so is it possible that a school like ADM could support a space like Black Mountain or something like this where people can actually just kind of be uncertain? And, and within, I mean, of course we want it to be rigorous, but just allowing a few of these methodologies that we, at least in art history, kind of know about mm -hmm. or ha happen, uh, and then 20 years later we go, oh, well, boy, that person was a genius. Now we're going to have a retrospective of Black Mountain, and let's just study mm -hmm. it. But I was wondering, like, instead of studying about it, it's possible, in academia, <laughs> because then they start to talk about accreditation, yeah. so I'd like to know what your idea or your feedback or something like a school like EGS or you know a European graduate school and things like that are because as soon as you say it, they're like well oh you know it hasn't been accredited well, you know, it, it depends on the institution, it depends on the leadership, it depends on many factors. But, uh, you know, at ETH Zurich, somebody came up with the idea, you know, we need a space where science and art can meet. And uh, then there were various discussions, how can you do it, etc. And then, um, you know, this idea was, let's start with young people. And we have a scientific artistic program as well. So we had science symposia, but we also tried to bring in artists as well uh, without forcing it. So you don't have in every symposium to have an artist, but whenever it was fitting, you know, I tried to bring in someone from the arts because usually it's, it's of interest. And um, somebody has to take the initiative and make it possible. But usually scientists appreciate it. And here at NTU, I was, uh, you had the uh, Global <coughs> uh, Youth Summit here, uh, together with the Nobel laureates uh, that, that came. And I was asked to moderate a discussion between a scientist and an artist, Ben Feringer, uh, Nobel laureate 2016, and the artist uh, Pistoletto. And, you know, it was a fantastic discussion we had. And the interesting moment, the kind of aha moment for me came when they both discovered, and you will not believe this, um, they both discovered the role played by mirrors in their work. So Pistoletto is an artist that has worked with mirrors and he can explain to you, you know, what he sees in a mirror and um, he also made some public um, performances, smashing a mirror because he thought, I have to protest against the idea. People think there is something mysterious behind the mirror and things like that. And then Ben Peringa says, you know, I use mirrors every day. Uh, I um, construct molecules. And as you know, life is asymmetric. We have chirality on the right and left side. So I have to use mirrors for my work. I said, wow, you know, <laughs> this is where art and science meet in an unexpected way. Now, this will not influence the scientific work and will not influence the artistic work, but you discover there's a larger world outside your own domain, and it's interesting. Go back to the Renaissance, you know, where people got interested. What did they say in literature? What did they say in the theater? What did they say in architecture? How to build a bridge? And they took over these principles. And it was from mechanics and technology to the literary and everything in between. And we need something like this again to you know, not get us into this technological digitalized funnel that everyone has to, to go through. So. <laughs> Thank you. Join me in thanking you. Thank you.